Okay, uh, I think we can start. So thank you everyone for joining. Uh, and the webinar is also live on the Alliance Facebook uh, page. So today we do have a packed uh, agenda. So uh, we're gonna start uh, now. So just to give you a brief about what we're going to discuss today in our webinar, we do have a presentation uh, from Y Labs on tackling barriers to cash and voucher assistance for unaccompanied adolescents by co-designing with adolescents. And then after the presentation and the Q&A, uh, we're going to have some updates from our colleagues from Save the Children uh, regarding the CP and Cash Toolkit. And then we're going to have plan to present their latest uh, evidence review, CVA and adolescents and uh, then we're going to have uh, the CP Alliance to present uh, the paper on social policy and child protection paper. And hopefully we, we will have some time uh, towards the end since this is our uh, last meeting for the Cash and Child Protection Task Force. And just to give you some updates about the future of the task force and how are we going to continue updating you uh, with what's happening on the CP and cash task force. Um, so I'm going to hand it over now to my colleague Eleonora uh, to present Y Labs and uh, what they're going to discuss today. Over to you, Eleonora. Thanks, Mirad. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to introduce our speaker, Katie Ash, who is a design lead at Y Labs, where she works at the intersection of human centered design, research, and youth empowerment. Katie has been uh, working for Y Labs for quite some time, and especially on this project in coordination with the IRC. This project aims to explore CVA for adolescents using a youth-driven design methodology that is particular for Y Labs and that she's going to introduce to us today. So without further notice, I'll let Katie start the presentation. As usual, we'll have about 20 minutes presentation. Feel free to like put your question in the chat or in the Q&A section. And then at the end, we'll have time to address those or you can also feel free to just like unmute yourself and ask directly to Katie. So Katie, over to you. Hi, um, I'm Katie. Today we are going to discuss a little bit about the way that Y Labs and IRC are working together, um, some background on the project, which we are calling Tagiro Cash, um, some of the basics of the design rest research methodologies that we'll be using, and then some basics about the next steps, uh, which are called rough prototyping, which is basically just making early examples um, of solutions to the problem. Y Labs uh, is a design and research organization, and we work to improve health and economic opportunities for young people, um, 10 to 24. Uh, we follow a process called youth-driven design, kind of comes from the concept of human-centered design, where you put the humans that you're designing for at the center of your process. Um, we take our step a bit further um, and we put youth really kind of in the driver's seat of design for us. What this means is that our project team includes youth, local youth that are brought onto the team and compensated for their time um, throughout the project. Um, young persons, perspectives are shape both the problem framing, what we focus on, um, and they co-develop the solutions with us um, instead of us just developing all of the concepts and then sharing them with the youth. We really train the interview participants in design enough that the concepts that are being generated um, are coming from young people. As an organization, we focus on several areas. Um, our work to date has included sexual and reproductive health, mental health, and economic inclusion, sometimes combined these concepts. And we really take a mixed method approach. Um, we have folks with backgrounds in behavioral science. Um, we combine youth-driven design. We do data collection, so we'll follow a bit of kind of typical research methodology to collect some quantitative data as the research progresses. And then we also have a public health lens with um, doctors and epidemiologists on the team. 
I won't talk through all of the steps of our process, um, but today I'm going to cover what design research looks like, how that is different from a typical research process. Um, after design research, you then uh, take what you find and you synthesize that, you find patterns, you map out the system, you understand your user better, um, and then you start to generate solutions that might solve the problem that you're trying to solve for your user. Um, and then rough prototyping is essentially really inexpensive, rapid tests that get you closer to being able to answer the question um, very rapidly. Um, and then it just kind of increases in fidelity as you go on um, through the process of design. Ultimately, you get to implementation recommendations that are based on data, that are based on really deep understanding of who your users are as well as a lot of experiments that you've run along the way through testing, um, testing things with users such that they can give you um, really good feedback on a bunch of different methods, in this case of service design. So some basics about Tagiro Cash um, are our four main um, research questions. We're focused on um, creating a safe cash and voucher assistance program for adolescents, including unaccompanied and separated children in the Shedder refugee camp in Ethiopia. Um, and the project has four main research questions. We're looking at what is the optimum delivery model um, for adolescents living in different care arrangements and humanitarian contexts. Um, can CVA provide Direct, uh, directed to unaccompanied and separated children lead to improved child protection outcomes. Um, looking at some around that. Um, what are any of the unintended or adverse consequences for adolescents? So taking a strong, um, strong look at any of the safeguarding measures that we are watching out for. Um, and what, if any, kind of complementary skill building for adolescents is needed to ensure um, ideal use for CVA? So is there anything that we could pair with um, the CVA to create a better condition for the youth? Some basics about the Shedder refugee camp. Um, it's one of three complexes um, in the Jijiga refugee complex um, in northern Ethiopia. It was opened in 2008. It has uh, almost 11,000 Somali refugees. Over 55% of the population is under 18. Um, so it's quite a, quite a few youth and there's approximately 300 unaccompanied and separated children living in the camp. Most of which are in family care, either with distant relation or foster family. Shutter is very remote with access to, via an unpaved road and the nearest city of Chichiga, which is about two hours away. So throughout our, our research, we will be um, speaking with about 50 youth. This will be interviewing them, co-designing with them, gathering mixed media with them. We'll be speaking to 11 caregivers, um, some relation and non-relation. Um, and then another really important thing that comes into design research as well as speaking to the other influencers in their life, thinking who are the people that really kind of form the relationship universe that affects unaccompanied and separated children in the camp. Um, so we'll be speaking with folks like youth group coordinators, um, administrators who oversee youth programming, um, community leaders who are identified by the youth that we speak with, as well as other folks within the camp. A typical process for us as well as we start out design research is that we map out the behavioral barriers that we find in literature review um, that indicate these are some of the things that are likely to form a barrier between the user and the desired behavior, which is to use the cash transfers safely and in a way that improves their well being. I won't go through all of these, um, but it's just to kind of demonstrate that, you know, throughout the design research process, we will be looking at all of these um, potential barriers and assessing to what degree um, they form a presence in the youth lives. As well, there's mapping behavioral drivers, um, which lead towards the positive outcomes for youth. 
So the first step in our process is design research. And it's really important um, when we design for someone else, we design for interpretation of their needs. And the more divergent our experiences from theirs, the more likely it is that we are wrong. So this process is really about um, recognizing that we don't know the solution that will be best for our users. And we're often rather unfamiliar with their universe. So design research is really having them tell us and map out um, from a relatively broad mindset, um, what it is that are the problems in their life, what are the dangers, what are their hopes and dreams. We unco uncover young people's needs and goals to inform the design of products and communications and services that might better meet their needs. It's important to really understand people before you can design for them well and understand what's going to be important for them um, and what is a program that can sustain. So some of the ways that academic research and design research are different. Um, design research is much broader um, and it aims to understand behaviors, um, latent needs and the kind of environment that forms the context where the innovation is needed. The output of design um, is often not a paper, it's often, you know, a tangible thing, a program, a service. The research question is intentionally broad, and you kind of find it as you go along the way. One of the things about traditional research, um, which I used to be a, a health researcher, is you kind of go in and you have a set research questions, and that doesn't necessarily change a lot between point A and point B. With design research, you're more like a detective. And as you go on, you're trying to solve this challenge, trying to understand um, this environment and that toolkit that you're utilizing during research really adapts as you kind of hone in um, through deep understanding with your users, what is important and what is unimportant. So some design research methods. There's a bunch of different types of design research activities. These are just some kind of common um, buckets. There's the journey map. Um, so this is when a young person will help us visualize a process that they'll go through in order to accomplish a goal. Often they'll be like drawing this out. Um, there's pri prioritization. Um, a, a common one that we will do, for example, um, is to have um, different types of adults like, you know, uh, teachers and parents um, and have them kind of arrange things in the uh, level of importance that kind of impact them, you know, and ask a question like, who would you go to advice on X and have them kind of arrange who they would go to first, who they'd go to second and go to third. And all of this is kind of a conversation piece um, because the most important part in design research is when you ask them why, and then you get to understand um, a deeper uh, level of like how these relationships interact. Um, there is perspective taking um, where you ask a youth to think beyond their own perspective and put themselves in somebody else's shoes. Um, a really important one that we always follow is youth as researchers. Um, and, and this really is having youth directly inform the data collection, um, have them um, be a part of the research team and make sure that um, the youth voice is always in the room so that our research, our design research doesn't drift off course. Um, conversation starters. Um, just prompting discussions with participants, kind of open-ended conversations. Um, I feel like you learn the most during design research um, when the participant becomes more comfortable and then they just start sharing some of the things that are important to them. Um, and they start to um, talk about something that is maybe at first seems unrelated, um, but becomes important in how you're framing the questions in the first place. So some activities that we will be using um, to understand um, the universe of the unaccompanied 
and separated children within the Shadow Refugee Camp is that we're uh, doing the activity morning, noon, and night. Um, where participants draw what happens at different parts of a typical day. So we'll draw like the a morning sun, a noon sun, and then the sun going down on a sheet of paper. Um, and then we'll prompt them to kind of draw what typically happens in this morning part of the day. And then as we move through the day, they kind of share what happens at these different stages. Um, they're all conversation starters and we ask them about it to get to understand what it is that happens in their typical days, who they see. And then we talk about how they feel about it. Um, a fun way, since we are always working with youth, we have tons of emoji stickers. So they put those around on the piece of paper to label how they feel at different points of the day. Um, and that also just kind of gets at a deeper level of questioning around emotion, what are the high points and what are the low points for them in a given day, life trajectories. Um, so we ask participants to draw out what they think their life um, or that of a peer um, will, would be like in five years, five years from now. This gets at what the assumptions are around what their future will look like. It gets out um, you know, what people's goals are, um, and it gets at cultural expectations. Um, we'll be asking caregivers to do this activity as well. What do they, th they think will happen um, to their foster child five years from now um, to kind of understand what are the things the youth want, what are the things that society, that the local society wants of the youth. Um, we'll be doing uh, relationship circles. So in this activity, you have a big sheet of paper um, and in the center, you draw a little stick person and you say, this is you. Um, and then there's concentric circles that go out on a sheet of paper and you ask them to draw what are the like most important people to you in your life. And they draw and describe them within the inner circle and then that um, keeps going out. Okay, who would be in that next circle for you? Okay, who would be in this like wider universe circle? So people you interact with and people you know and people that are in your life. Um, and this just kind of prompts a lot of conversation and there's a lot of questions here around, um, you know, who are safe people? Um, you know, who of these people would you go to um, if you needed X? advice on um, relationships, who would you go to if you needed advice on money, um, things like this to probe at um, relationship dynamics lab. We'll be doing structure, structured journaling um, where we send the youth home with visualized journals that have prompts, um, both written and like visually depicted. Um, that we will to be literacy friendly. And so we'll be explaining to them before we send them home with them what those various prompts are. But then at the end of the research, we will collect the journals back from them um, and debrief um, what they drew, what they doodled, um, why they shared those things. Last but not least is co-design sessions. So in co-design sessions, um, they happen throughout the research at, at different points. As we discover more um, in the background, we're creating um, system maps, we're creating relationship maps um, of what people's lives look like, um, what these relationship universes look like for the young people, what the physical environment system looks like. We'll be drawing out a map in the background. Um, we'll be drawing out kind of behavior and relationship to money map. Um, and then we'll do co-design sessions for various parts um, of designing the program with the youth participants themselves where they come in. Um, we train them in design. Um, and then we do a highly interactive session where they're generating ideas to various um, problems that we're seeing. Um, so they um, come in really heavily. Usually the ideas that um, turn into the programs and services are coming from youth participants. So 
introduction to rough prototyping. After we do design research, all of that learning comes in forms a picture um, of these systems. Um, and based on our understanding of these systems, we will uh, generate some solutions and start to move towards um, different ideas that we can test. Um, so rough prototyping happens after all of that. You synthesize and map out, and then you generate some ideas, and then you rough prototype those ideas. So prototyping is about making your ideas tangible and testable. Um, and typically we prototype in a couple of phases um, and we improve and refine concepts as we learn more along the way from potential users um, and the community uh, that the users live within. The first step in prototyping is to do a rough prototype. And it's a tangible, very low cost model that you can put in front of users um, to test essential questions that you have um, around different solutions. Um, sometimes you will test a rough prototype um, just to learn more about a solution. You'll potentially create a technology uh, rough prototype to understand better how folks are using mobile phones, for example. This uh, image right here is of an actual rough prototype um, that we developed um, at a clinic for youth to provide feedback on their healthcare providers. So you basically prototype um, because it allows you to fail quickly, rapidly, um, and extremely cheaply. Um, instead of you know launching a program that's really well articulated based on what we think the user's needs are, um, we're showing them a lot of uh, concepts uh, that took us 15 minutes to draw on a piece of paper. And this elicits a really different kind of feedback that we get from users. Um, there's something that happens when somebody actually sees the solution versus talking about it hypothetically that just gets you a really different type of feedback where they can um, really tell you why that won't work um, or why one solution might work a lot better and you start to uncover these um, deeper needs. We're always asking ourselves, what's the cheapest and fastest way to get an answer to a question when we're testing rough prototypes? It's still um, definitely a moment when you're learning and it uh, kind of along the way will become something that is um, more refined, that looks more like a finished program. The other thing about rough prototyping, that's one of the things that I love is that you kind of have to make them look bad. You have to make them look like really early stage um, because people are so friendly everywhere that if, it, if something looks finished, they want to compliment you on it. They want to tell you that it looks good. Folks will not be as critical with you, but if you have just early prototypes um, that look not great, that are just stick figures and it's drawn out, and you have like a diagram of how a program would work, they will tell you all of the reasons why that won't work because it doesn't look like you've built it yet. There's a lot of different ways of testing. Um, you can do paper prototypes um, for services. You can do role plays and experiential prototypes. And this is usually, you know, just like in a research room or a side room um, where you ask a participant to role play um, their side of a service experience and then you're doing the other side of a service experience. So I'm like pretending to be a nurse that, you know, does something a different way than I typically would. And then you kind of debrief that scenario. Another common one uh, for testing a service or program is to create storyboards. So you just draw out um, different frames of like a comic and you say like this happens, then this would happen and then this would happen. Um, and then they can kind of visualize themselves going through that process and give you feedback on how that would feel, um, if they think that would work in the community context. 
Um, oftentimes I'll ask a participant if they think other people their age would like it to get at um, their kind of deeper beliefs around it um, so that they don't have to personally give you bad feedback. They can become depersonalized and they can give you feedback that they think their peers would feel about it. Um, and then a very, very common one is paper mock-ups. So just markers, sheets of paper, um, drawing out phone screens even um, that create a representation that's good enough that people can understand what is happening through the drawing. But again, it needs to look rough such that you get really positive or really plentiful feedback on your solution. So that is just some basics of the background of our methods and the process that we will be following for this project. Are there any questions? Okay, so before like um, I open up for question, I just see there are some questions. So I just wanted to clarify where we are at with the project and what's IRC's role in the project. So like uh, basically we have not progressed as much as we wanted on this project just because due to COVID and other unforeseen issues um, with the, um, uh, in Ethiopia. And so at this stage, this is where we are at. We developed with Wild Labs all these and we developed a, a reserve, what we call a design research guide tailored for Ethiopia that we will be testing and we will be training the team in IRC in Ethiopia in late January. Um, so the way this is that we will have, uh, we have HQ involved in IRC for like technical soundproofing, all the materials. And then we have like, here you go, thanks Katie. And then we have uh, the IRC Ethiopia team who has a, a child protection team following up then accompanying and separated children and providing them case management. And they will be following this adolescent throughout the whole process from research to the actual delivery of uh, cash. And then we have an ERD team. And so they will follow up also like the distribution of the cash and the post monitoring once this ideation phase um, is completed. I also want to mention that we have an advisory group for this project and you can see the organization, some members might be on this call actually. And that was because we wanted like this process to be participatory and to ensure that we were linked to other similar projects out there or that we didn't duplicate or that we didn't we prevented any risk or mitigation factor that other encountered in in, in similar project so that's just to summarize where we are at now i think i can now open it for question feel free to also raise your hand and unmute yourself if you want to ask those questions otherwise i'm just going to read through some of the questions that came in the chat somebody is asking if there is a prototype project for north syria adolescents the answer i would say is not with us um, and not with the y labs but i I don't know if any other organization is doing that. Another question for you, Katie, is how did you involve or we will be involve uh, various needs of people with disability in the research? Yeah, there isn't kind of an explicit directive within the research to focus on disability. That being said, it will uh, likely in some way show up in the research as it often does. Um, when speaking with quite a few um, youth and speaking with a lot of folks within the camp who uh, work to support um, youth that have um, kind of more complex case histories. Just two additional questions. So Lauren was wondering the time frame for the project. So technically the project is supposed to end at the end of May, June uh, of this year. We're asking for a cost extension, no cost extension, we're still negotiated to allow us for more time. But at the moment, as I said, like uh, the Wild Labs team will do the training and start the, um, the key informant interview and focus group discussion using this methodology at the end of January in Ethiopia. Um, and then we will move along from there. Somebody is asking, Katie, what risks do you foresee in undertaking this research? Um, well, one of the things that um, 
we've been talking a lot about and IRC is really focused on is making sure that when we conduct this research, um, we don't create too much excitement within the community about the upcoming um, pilot that will happen after the research. There's definitely a possibility that this can create uh, an environment of pressure for the youth that participate um, in the research, feeling like there are financial implications um, to the research, as well as word spreading, you know, within the camp that this pilot is going to happen, um, which could potentially lead um, and has led in programming before to creation of an artificial environment where, you know, youth may become eligible for funding by, you know, becoming an unaccompanied youth. So what are some other things that you would speak to, Eleonora? Yeah, no, I think what you said is correct, yeah. um, Katie. We are still, we want to like, we already like kind of drawn what we think are the risks, yeah. but we want to really hear from the adolescent if there is anything that we, we have not foreseen. Um, I remember in another project, we all foreseen like, you know, uh, the adolescent abusing the use of cash and really use it to buy alcohol and drugs. And then instead we didn't foresee that they would actually sell the vouchers to actually get the cash to buy cooking products. So like, you know, we, we really want to hear from them um, in those respect. Um, Aftab, yeah, please go ahead and unmute yourself if you can. Thanks, uh, Mansi, Eleonora. Thanks, Katie, for the presentation. Yeah, my question is, uh, in the methodology, if you provide stories to the different scenarios to the, to the adolescents and communities, I was wondering that would they get biased with this to answer in that direction? Bias to answer. So you're describing like when I describe different ways that a service could happen, they'll become biased towards one of them? Yes, yes. Like suppose if we give them three or four scenarios and maybe they would, they would like to answer in, on the lines of that scenario instead of answering from their own. That's my question, actually. That's my concern. <clears throat> I hope you yeah. can come with, that, with an answer with an evidence you have. Yeah, that's definitely, um, that's definitely something that happens. Um, and it's definitely a concern and something that we're mindful of is once you put something in front of somebody, they become anchored um, on this kind of set of solutions that look like the one that you've just put in front of them. And if you ask them to come up with other ideas, instead of having a broad set of ideas, now they're kind of anchored around things that are similar to that. Um, so that's just something that we have to be cognizant of. W one of the ways that we get around to that is we'll show, you know, three or four really, really different solutions and put that in front of them to show, okay, there's actually a really wide set of ways of solving this problem. Which one do you think is better? Um, which one do you think is more likely to work? Um, unfortunately, you know, at some point we need to stop being so broad and start going towards action um, and testing out different solutions. So as we hone in on a set of potential solutions, um, we do have to start putting things in front of people so that we can start getting towards a program, a service, um, or product that will kind of end up result in something real and tangible that will solve their problem. We have about five minutes or less, so I would like allow and one additional question if anybody has one, um, and then we wrap up and we move on the agenda. Okay. Um, the question is around to what extent we take into consideration existing cash programming um, and figure out how these things can work together to ultimately be more efficient. So the answer to that is we definitely take it into consideration. We, it's a really important factor to understand um, what the cash flow currently looks like within the camp, what that resourcing looks like on family levels, what that looks like um, for the families um, that are housing 
um, the unaccompanied and separated children that we are interviewing and what that dynamic is around um, those funds. Um, you know, really understanding who it is that um, is receiving those funds, who's making the financial decisions currently, who it's acceptable to be making financial decisions for within the community. Um, there's a lot of different factors um, that we consider here. Um, and definitely um, we will be uh, interviewing um, other folks within the camp who oversee um, the cash programming, not just from the participant uh, participants and users perspective, but also from the administrator perspective around cash to get kind of a better systems overview. So these things will definitely be something that is factored in heavily in order to make sure that what we design is going to function well um, within the current systems. Yeah, and just to add the last piece before we wrap this up, like uh, one of the key criteria to select the country when we had this project was there needed to be some cash disbursed in the community to adults as a key criteria just for this not to like have any tension within the community, uh, which is the case, uh, not done by IRC, or I'm not sure if it's done by IRC, and is not like a blanket distribution, but it is there on a case by case um, scenario. So I think, well, unfortunately, we need to move on. Thanks a lot. If you have any question, we'll be sharing this presentation and you can, as usual, email us to ask additional question for Katie. Thanks a lot, Katie, for being uh, presenting this project uh, here today. Mirette, do you want to put up the presentation? Okay, perfect. So yeah, I think we can start with, uh, I think I saw Laurie. So maybe we can start with, uh, Laurie, a presentation from Save the Children, just to give us some updates uh, for the CP and cash toolkit. So hi, everyone, and thanks for um, allowing me to join uh, and give a, a brief presentation. So I just wanted to give a bit of an update on what we've been leading on for CVA and child protection in terms of tool development. And I should say Save the Children's leading, but it is guided by a um, interagency steering group. So it's really just being project managed um, by Save the Children. So I think I've given this presentation a few times, so I'll go through it fairly quickly. But just to say that in 2019, a scoping study was conducted by Paul Harvey to look at um, the monitoring of child protection within humanitarian cash programs. And one of the key recommendations that came from this report was um, the development of an m and &E toolkit for use in cash and voucher assistance interventions. And this was, I think, acknowledging the evidence base that is needed for um, and the kind of the gaps that we know exist when it comes to CVA and CP. So the recommendation was that the M&E toolkit should identify child protection risks, mitigation strategies, and then help to actually monitor child protection outcomes. So the process uh, for developing these tools, this was led by Hannah Thompson, um, a consultant working with us, who I think actually might hopefully still be on the call in case there's questions that pop up. As I mentioned before, we had a reference group that um, provided review and revisions to each one of the tools. The original plan was to go and pilot in person in Colombia. However, due to COVID, we had to shift around some of our plans. So we got written feedback from Somalia, Nigeria, and Syria. In um, Northwest Syria, the tools were used with affected populations by um, local organization Shafa. And we've got some, a few countries lined up to start testing or rather kind of rolling out and using these tools in 2021. And this includes um, Colombia, Somalia, Cambodia, and then we've got a few more in um, Latin and Central America. So the components of the toolkit is there's three tools. So there's one document that kind of provides an overview and a summary. The first tool is a focus group discussion guide. The second tool is a survey um, that all actors can use. And the third tool is specifically um, a tool that we'd expect uh, to be used in case management. And that is also a survey tool. And one thing I forgot to mention is that um, kind of the structure and outline of this was based on um, the WRC's toolkit around uh, GBV. So we took and borrowed a lot of kind of the uh, learnings from that and the structure so that we could have them be fairly complementary. So the first tool um, 
is designed to be conducted before any form of CVA starts. And again, this is looking at those risks and mitigations and helps us to understand kind of how we, how we can design the, the programming. Then we have the option of, the, of using tool two and or tool three. So tool two um, can be used by all actors after CDA has started and tool three can be used during the case management process. So if the CDA is specifically designed with a link to the case management program, this would be appropriate. So based on um, kind of piloting these tools, getting feedback, I think not surprisingly, the more we created, the more we found out uh, the gaps that exist. So I just wanted to include a brief slide on kind of what is coming next based on these discussions and needs. And I know Anita is going to present next. Um, so there's a lot of kind of um, collaboration and complementarity between the two organizations and kind of the documents and guidance that we'll be able to produce. So one of the requests that came up was you know, we're monitoring and we're, we're leaning on case management, child protection case management, and we want to monitor child protection outcomes. But one of the um, gaps that was identified is we don't actually have tools for caseworkers to discuss money management or budget management with the families they work with. So um, Hannah's led on the development of a money management toolkit for caseworkers. And this includes a script uh, for caseworkers to use, things for them to discuss with families, and then several budget management tools. And this is really some basic tools of uh, what are you planning on spending? What are your income sources? And then what are you actually spending? And then has a, a few selections on kind of how to prioritize. So they really serve as a um, guidance for discussion for the caseworkers. So these uh, tools have been created and they're ready in their pilot form at the moment. They are being used in Cambodia um, and uh, caseworkers are now using them actually with families. So in Cambodia, they have uh, did the first meeting with families just before they received cash assistance. And now they're doing the second meeting directly after they've reached, um, received cash assistance. A re another request that came up is from that m and &E toolkit it's quite an expansive and extensive toolkit. And so um, we had a few, few colleagues across the globe say, this is great, but can you give us something really quick? If we need to do this fast, what do we need to prioritize and kind of how do we navigate these tools? So we've got a few quick guides um, currently available in English, but uh, to be translated in Arabic, French, and Spanish. Um, and I should actually add that all tools we're currently working on the translation of. So all tools should be available in English, Arabic, French, and Spanish, uh, at least these first ones by March and then the rest by the end of the year. And then another request that came up is, okay, we have the m &E tools, but how do we actually analyze the data that comes from this? And then how do we use that to inform our programming moving forward? So we also have a um, draft guidance document on how to actually analyze the data and how to have it inform programming. Um, and this has been done in coordination with the AME working group as well. In 2021, um, we are, I'm sorry, that says March 2020, but it should say March 2021 at the top. In, so for the remainder of the year, we're working on an adolescent friendly tool. So in that m and &E toolkit, uh, the tools are currently all geared towards adults. And we had quite a few country officers say, but we really want to actually solicit the feedback from adolescents themselves. So um, PLAN, and uh, Anita will talk more about this, I'm sure, is go, has done quite a lot of work already on kind of specifically the adolescent focus of CVA. So we're going to be looking together at how we make an adolescent friendly tool that kind of can, can get this feedback um, throughout, the, throughout the program cycle. We are also looking to create a capacity building package. So this is geared towards uh, child protection and also CVA actors. So we're hoping that we can kind of demystify the two sectors for each other in this package and have a shared understanding. And with this, we're going to focus really on a face-to-face -face package. Um, but of course, we very much acknowledge the times we live in. So um, it will be working as well with PLAN um, and WRC on the content and then um, plan taking forward kind of the e-module element of that. And our goal is this year, as countries are piloting and using that um, m and &E toolkit, we want to collect data and create an evidence report. And this is in hopes of kind of 
adding to the um, the evidence base for CVA and CP acknowledging those gaps. Um, so if any uh, other organization is interested in seeing the tools or interested in piloting them, please, please do reach out to us because kind of the more we can get this, more data we can gather, the more evidence we can put behind um, CVA and CP. And then the last two pieces is one specifically on guidance for cash and voucher assistance for child-headed households and unaccompanied children. So this will be a really practical user-friendly guide that points to relevant resources and discusses the specific considerations. Um, I know at least within Save the Children um, and if the our steering committee members have echoed the same, this is one of the most common questions we get is, should we give cash to childhood households and unaccompanied children? And, and it, you know, what are the conditions? Kind of what do we need to have taken into consideration? So really excited to also hear about the work um, from the IRC and YLAB and how this can kind of feed in and inform. Um, and then lastly, we're looking at a cash and child protection programmatic guidance document. So this is going to be, again, really practical. And it's basically, um, if a cash and or CP um, actor or implementer in country really wants to kind of think about what I need to consider throughout the programmatic cycle before we start as we're designing implementation, monitoring, et cetera, this will just have kind of all the resources that are out there linked in one place um, with guidance on kind of where to start and, um, and how to move through the process. And we can go to the next slide, but the next slide just says thank you. And um, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to look at them in the in the chat box and respond. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie. And um, maybe if Eleonora, if you can help me just check if there are any questions in the chat box for uh, Laurie. Sylvia is asking if uh, like the tools have been piloted in some countries, and if so, if any findings or recommendation for design or implementation is already out. Yeah. Hi, Sylvia. Thanks. That's a great question. So we we were only able to really pilot it in um, northwest Syria. And then the other countries, we were able to just get feedback from actors who kind of workshopped the tools. And we have some preliminary findings, but we really want to focus this year on kind of more systematically gathering findings from the data so that we can write something up. Um, in terms of recommendations for design and implementation, there was, because it hasn't been necessarily piloted as extensively, um, we, haven't, we haven't got something more kind of systematic. However, there was, um, Shafa did present, and I think there is a recording of kind of their experience using it and their recommendations that we could potentially point to or circulate. Um, and I see another question, when is it planned to be piloted? So yes, uh, it was already piloted, but we're hoping to roll it out further this year. So um, I'd be happy to point to the resources. They're all available currently. We're just waiting for the final formatting. Um, but if colleagues are interested, we can send you kind of the Word versions um, if you're interested in piloting these or kind of rolling them out further in your programs. Hi, this is Hannah Thompson. Can I just add to that, Laurie? Please, please. Um, so just, just to... Uh, to what Laurie said and sort of uh, reaffirm that so Shafak basically inv involved a, a quite small number of recipients of cash and voucher assistance because of the fact that we have restrictions I mean both because of security but also COVID um, and so whilst they did have findings it's not something that we can generalize yet um, and so we will be producing a report where we hope to get more of this data from other settings um, but there's a one, uh, well, it's not one page, actually, it's a uh, sort of three page infographic um, that um, I'm sure we can share with Mirette and Eleanor and have put on the, um, put on the Alliance website so that people can see what their findings were. Yeah, sure. Thanks for clarifying, Hannah. And as Laurie pointed out, yes, we had a webinar on this with Shafak that it's available, the recording is available on the CP Alliance, so we can also share that again with the participants. Great, thank you so much, Lori. And now we can uh, move ahead with Anita from Plan to update us also on the work they've been doing around cash and voucher assistance for adolescents. So over to you, Anita. Thanks, Mirette, and thanks so much, Katie and Lori, for the um, very interesting presentation. I'm Anita, and I work for Plan International. And in the next few minutes, uh, I'm going to provide you um, with a very brief <laughs> overview of uh, plan uh, and WRC um, cash for adolescents. So um, 
Okay, just uh, as an introduction, basically uh, cash and voucher assistance is an increasingly used modality uh, within plants humanitarian response program. However, at the moment, there is no organizational guidance on the use of uh, um, CVA in, um, in programming, specifically to support uh, um, adolescents in humanitarian settings. And also, although we do have evidence and learning on uh, the impact of uh, um, CVA on child protection and education outcomes for adolescents, in humanitarian setting, this is very limited. This is why um, one year and a half ago, we decided, plan decided to partner with the uh, uh, Women's Refugee Commission in order to synthesize learning and strengthen uh, uh, our internal capacity on uh, the use of cash and voucher assistance to achieve uh, um, protection, education, and uh, broader well-being outcomes for um, adolescents in humanitarian settings. So what you see on the slide are uh, the three first products of the collaboration between PLAN and the Women's Refugee Commission, which I'm going to uh, briefly introduce uh, in, in the next um, few minutes. So before diving into the presentation, I would like to make sure that uh, we have the same understanding with regards to CVA for adolescents. There are actually three ways in which adolescents can benefit from CVA programming. So number one, um, adolescents can be indirect beneficiaries of uh, um, household level cash assistance, um, which means that in this case, adolescents might benefit indirectly from uh, CVA simply by being part of a household or family that uh, is targeted for CVA. So in this scenario, we have the head of the household uh, who, who is the recipient of uh, uh, the CVA and uh, um, may use uh, the cash and voucher assistance for the well-being of the family members, including adolescents. An example of this is uh, multipurpose cash grants targeting vulnerable houses. Then we have a second modality. So adolescents can also be indirect beneficiaries of individual level assistance. In this case, uh, uh, cash and voucher assistance is transferred to an adult in the household where the um, adolescent lives. And there is a clear purpose of using the cash for uh, specific needs of uh, um, adolescents in the household. An example of this, I'm sure we're all very familiar with such example, is uh, um, has to do with education grants, um, which can be used to cover for school fees, uh, school uniforms, uh, school books, etc. And then the last example, which is very much in line with uh, um, the first presentation that we've heard from, from Katie. So adolescents can also be direct beneficiaries of individual level assistance. And so in this case, uh, um, CVA can be transferred directly to adolescents. An example is the cash transfer targeting an accompanying adolescent. Right, so um, in the... Um, Let's say in the products that I'm going to present, uh, um, we have tried to take in, into account all these three modalities, knowing that uh, um, there is certainly more evidence and we have more practice for some modalities over others. When we started our collaboration with, uh, um, we started our collaboration with WRC by conducting a desk review of existing literature on cash and voucher assistance for uh, um, adolescent outcomes. Uh, the desk st study review um, recent evidence from various sectors, so not just child protection, but also GBV, um, education, health, nutrition, and livelihood. And uh, um, we reviewed academic articles, uh, um, but also project documents, reports, case studies, and, and program tools from, from various agencies including uh, most of the agencies which are on the call today. And to complement the desk review, we also um, interview the experts in child protection, education, cash, and adolescent programming, working both for uh, um, NGOs and UN agencies. And uh, um, all those experts were interviewed on topics such as uh, implementation of CVA for adolescents, risk and benefits of uh, um, CVA for adolescents across uh, various outcomes. 
Um, so I won't present the findings of the desk review um, and of the consultation because this was not really the, the objective of my uh, presentation today, but I'm, I'm happy to organize another uh, presentation through the Alliance uh, um, in the next uh, in the next month, where I can really provide a very detailed overview of the findings and recommendation of the desk review. Just for you to know the findings and the recommendation touch upon uh, um, topics such as uh, the use of uh, sex, age, and disability disaggregated data in CDA programming, um, uh, targeting adolescents as uh, direct CDA recipients effectively and safely. Um, there are also some interesting findings around, around cash plus programming. So, um, recommendation around the, the intervention that should be implemented alongside um, cash and voucher assistance. And then there are specific findings related to the various sectors that you see listed there, such as child protection, education, sexual reproductive health, and, and so forth. Together with the Women's Refugee Commission, we also conducted a um, counter-assessment in Central Africa Republic and in Egypt in uh, 2019 to document uh, lessons learned of plants project using CVA for adolescent protection, education, and well-being outcomes. So specifically, oh, sorry, um, it's not very visible, but um, specifically um, our project in um, Central, Africa, Central Africa Republic is a project where uh, um, we provide cash transfer to foster and notified families alongside a package of child protection services such as family tracing and notification, life skills, and positive parenting while the project in Egypt is more focused on uh, um, education. So through this project, we um, provide education grants to Syrian and Egyptian uh, families to improve access to education services and uh, uh, retention for children and adolescents up to 14 years. Uh, and uh, um, as for the project in CAR, um, the, uh, the education grants are accompanied by other interventions, such as rehabilitation of learning spaces, provision of learning material, training of teachers, and uh, um, life skills and positive parenting sessions. So the case studies give an overview of strengths and challenges of a planned CVA program targeting adolescents. Okay, so based on the uh, information that we were able to gather through the desk review and the case studies, just to say, based on all this information, we have developed, uh, actually, I should say we are still in the process of developing a guidance on uh, CVA for adolescents, which will support humanitarian practitioners to design, plan for, implement, um, and monitor projects where uh, CVA is used to achieve protection, education, and well-being outcomes for adolescents. As you can see, the guidance is uh, structured around uh, um, the program cycle management phases. Um, uh, so in, in the second column, um, I, uh, I try to give an idea of the topics which will be covered by each uh, chapter and phase. Uh, um, so maybe we could, for example, zoom in in on the response design and strategy planning. As you can see um, under this phase, uh, we would like to cover uh, what is needed to design uh, um, adolescent responsive CVA program, including targets and indicators. We will uh, cover uh, um, targeting with specific consideration on uh, when it's uh, best to target uh, um, caregivers uh, and when it's best to target adolescents. And then uh, following on, uh, uh, there will be some key consideration around selecting the transfer modality and delivery mechanism, defining uh, value, duration, and frequency of the cash transfer, and then consideration around sustainability. Just to say in plan, uh, we do have uh, an adolescence responsive program framework, which as you can see, um, as a specific goal, objectives, outcomes, and activities. And what we are uh, um, trying to do with the Cash for Adolescents guidance is to um, reflect and define the role that uh, CVA 
could play across the various uh, activities designed to support specific outcomes and objectives um, in line with uh, the programmatic framework that you see in there. Um, so we, we have really taken uh, the standard uh, activities that we implement under child protection, education, and other sector, and really uh, think, okay, what could be the role of uh, um, CVA across all those inter all those interventions? As you probably know already, CVA uh, in some instances can be used as a program input, uh, as a compensation to staff, but also to relieve uh, economic barriers. So um, that's the end of my presentation, but maybe I just would like to reaffirm uh, what uh, um, Lori was mentioning before. Alongside the CVA guidance plan uh, intends also to develop a capacity building package. And indeed we have discussed with Save the Children the possibility to pull together our resources so that we can, uh, we could develop both face-to-face -face and online uh, um, capacity building package. And also, as you have heard, uh, SAVE is also developing guidance uh, on uh, CVA and child protection. And so uh, we will make sure that obviously um, uh, there will be harmonization across the two guidance and that uh, linkages will be, will be made uh, whenever possible. So just the last word, in case you want to know more about this initiative, feel free to reach out to myself or to Tenzin, who is the Senior Cash and Livelihood Advisor at the Women's Refugee Commission. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Anita. Great. So, and now we come to our uh, final presentation. So we have Hany from the Alliance and he's going to present a brief about the social protection and child protection uh, policy paper. So over to you, Hany. Great. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, and Happy New Year to those that we haven't talked to before. My name is Hani Mansourian, and I co-coordinate the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. As uh, some of you may be aware, when COVID happened, we started several collaborations across sectors and with, with different partners to develop material that would help the sector basically better do the work that they normally do under COVID. So a lot of, uh, a lot of our work has focused on adaptation of our typical work to to the COVID situation. One of the, the last pieces that we did among probably about 12 uh, different technical notes that we produced was this one on social protection and child protection. And it came out of the understanding that the impact of the restrictions that were placed because of COVID on the whole population of the world almost, uh, but primarily in, in countries that lower, lower middle, middle income countries and countries that are dealing with humanitarian crises. So it came out of the understanding that the, the impact of the socioeconomic impact of COVID-19 restrictions are going to be immense and are going to be long lasting. So we paired up with uh, several social protection colleagues across many of the agencies that are present here, including IRC, SAVE, uh, UNICEF and others. Uh, to develop this, this policy paper to, to bring together the, the evidence around how social protection and child protection can support each other and provide some recommendations. Um, so it is on our, on our website, on the Alliance website, you can find the actual, actual policy paper and it is being translated into uh, three other languages, Arabic, Spanish and, and French. So the objective of the, of the paper um, was to lay out key arguments for close collaboration across social protection and child protection to address the socioeconomic uh, impact of COVID on children and, and families. Um, and of course, we take a very, um, we take a socio-ecological approach to this uh, because of the, the way COVID has impacted the population and also because of the way social protection programs work and connect with protection of children. So some of the highlights, of course, it's the, the socioeconomic crisis that is coming up and has, has started in many countries is unprecedented and it's exacerbating a lot of the root causes of child protection and child survival and well-being. And I wanna emphasize on this issue of root causes because there will be people who would argue that we don't know if child protection issues are, are significantly worse than before or not. But almost there's, there's, there's almost no one that would argue that the root causes, poverty, um, reduced access to health or education, and uh, reduced access to social and, and child protection services have not been impacted. So we know that these elements 
um, things like hunger and, and uh, poverty will lead to child protection issues based on evidence that we have from decades of work. And we know that COVID has impacted these very directly. So that's kind of the main argument of, of why the socioeconomic situation is going to, and is already leading to, to child protection negative outcomes. So we, we believe that children urgently need financial and social protection systems to be properly and uh, effectively linked to child protection services for it to be functional. Some of the arguments of why it's important, um, one is the evidence that we have in terms of how social protection actually supports child protection outcomes. The second is on the synergies that exist. And many countries, as, as you well know, uh, social protection and, and child protection actually fall under the same ministry. So there are lots of natural synergies that exist between the two. And thirdly, the consistency of bringing together expertise from both sectors, cons sorry, consistently bringing expertise from, the, from two sectors will yield substantially better results. Um, and this is again supported by the evidence that that we have reflected in this in this paper. Some of the evidence that we have uncovered, we kind of categorized them into three categories. One, one category is about how um, risks and, and, and protective factors that link to negative child protection outcomes can be supported or addressed by social protection. So there's a quote there from the, from the paper that talks about how social protection can contribute to the reduction of risk factors and strengthening pr protective factors related to child protection issues such as violence, risky sex sexual behavior, child marriage, and others. So the second category of evidence that we, we have covered in the, in the paper is about how providing support to caregivers can lead to better child protection outcomes. As, as I mentioned, um, it, it links back to the whole socio-ecological model and, and approach that we, we have based this whole policy paper on. And, and the last category is on, on the in increased uh, access to services that can support protection outcomes. Again, as I mentioned, uh, there are natural synergies between the two, um, the two systems, the child protection systems and the social protection systems. We just often don't uh, take advantage of those, of those natural synergies that, that exist. Some of the recommendations, again, recommendations are categorized into different categories. The first category is on financing policy and coordination. I won't read through all of them, but I'll just mention a few uh, and, and we move forward just for the sake of time. Under financing policy and coordination, one of them is on urgently including child protection components into social protection pro projects. There's a lot more detail in the actual policy paper if you go and look at it on, under each of these. Another element is, is how to join forces to inf inform and impact policy and, and how to work with donors and multilaterals uh, to push them towards these synergies. Um, another category of recommendations is on program design and implementation. For example, we talk about uh, ensuring safeguarding protection from sexual exploitation and abuse and protection mainstreaming uh, and the participation of children in program design and implementation. Ensuring a focus on child protection at the design stage of, uh, of COVID-19 social protection projects. There is actually a, a really interesting uh, infographic in the in the document itself. I think and it's one of one of the first pages. It's a child sensitive uh, programming diagram, uh, which really helps kind of put put a lot of these in in perspective. Another whole category is on monitoring and evaluation, and it talks about, for example, building on learning from existing innovative and successful pilots. Linked to this, I will mention that there there are multiple case studies that we have try to bring into as an annex to this to this policy paper to help illustrate some of the some of the successful pilots that have uh, that have been taking place both in child protection and, and also gender um, responsive and, and GBV programming. Another category of recommendations is on on the system wide approach, ensuring that lessons from COVID-19 um, can help us design social protection programs and systems that are more child sensitive, gender responsive, inclusive, and shock responsive. Again, these are just the top line uh, of what is covered there. For more details, please go uh, to the document itself and, and read it. Yes, as I mentioned, there are five case studies. And if I'm not mistaken, two of them are specifically on cash va voucher assistance and, and humanitarian cash. So two of them are specifically from humanitarian, uh, again, just from my memory, uh, from humanitarian context. Um, and the, the other three are from, from fragile or, uh, or development 
context. So the way forward, we are mobilizing focal points uh, from country level organizations and networks to have um, kind of regional and country level launches of these pol this policy paper, because we want to make sure that this policy paper doesn't remain on the shelf and in, on the website, but rather becomes a source of change. So we are really trying to mobilize through, a, through an extensive launch plan that we have developed, uh, thanks to Sarah and, and uh, Laura and others. We are trying to implement this at multiple levels, from the global level to uh, all the way down to the, to the local level, to make sure that there's an impact from this policy paper. We are distributing the guidance very widely, and as soon as the, the Spanish, Arabic, and French become available, those also will be placed on our website and distributed widely, and we will have very specific launches of this. We are working, for example, with World Bank, which is one of the largest actors, as all of you know, in, in social protection and cash programming to potentially have a launch jointly with them. So there will be a lot that will come around this paper. So I'll stop there and hand back over to Eleanor and Miret. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Tani. And we will be sharing all the material and all the presentations yeah. anyway. So if you'd like to get back in touch with the presenters uh, later, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, we only have a few minutes to wrap up. So just a very quick update from my side and Eleonora. So this is our last uh, official meeting for the cash and child protection task force and as you may know we've been saying this for the last few uh, meetings we're transitioning from uh, a task force to having focal points from uh, the alliance in the different cash and protection uh, working groups such as the uh, cash and child protection uh, task force under the GPC and also the CALP, uh, as well as uh, organizing closely with uh, the cash and child protection task team, just to make sure that we're not recreating other coordination meetings that is already happening, but making sure we're really collaborating closely with other cash and child protection or in general cash and protection groups that are out there. Uh, however, we're going to keep the member list as is, so uh, we're going to update you regularly, hopefully through uh, maybe a quarterly newsletter with what's happening out there in the cash and child protection arena. Also, feel free to join the GPC as well. We had a call with Stefan from the GPC, and we're going to send along uh, the contact as well, if you'd like to join the cash and protection task team. So yeah, I mean, we're, we will still be in touch with you, but in maybe in a different form. Yeah, no, I mean, we had, uh, we are having meetings, Mirat and I, so we had a meeting, uh, uh, as she said, with Stefan, we'll have a meeting, so we'll help. If you can think of any other group or any other particular forum where we should be active, please do feel free to like, send us an email and we will see what we can do but like you know at any time like we're also already in touch with the save the children and anita for the work that they're doing to have kind of a more interagency and be sure that we are the focal point so we we can also like you know work with them in terms of updating this group if you want to do something similar for another project not to duplicate efforts and ensure that it's a bit more coordinated please get in touch with us we're not we're not disappearing we're just like stopping as a task force with the work plan and regular meetings but as Mirat said we want to keep this group active and send um, updates as soon as much as we can great thank you so much uh, everyone and uh, we'll uh, we'll be in touch and we'll send you all the material from uh, today presentations and uh, thanks for all our presenters as well yeah. Have a good day. Thanks. Have a good day. Bye.